had a chance to meet at least one of you so far. I know the program just getting kicked off, and I uh, look forward to meeting uh, more of you as time goes on. So thanks for spending some of your time with me today. I hope it'll be impactful and uh, you guys can take something away from it. Uh, I was asked to come in and actually give a talk on working with Fortune 500 companies and enterprise sales. I think there were a couple of requests put in there, so I'm not sure. Those came from some of you guys, but I'm gonna try to hit on those, um, but uh, also try to keep it at a, a, a broader level. Um, I will go back to some foundational core stuff, so I apologize if some of it seems a low level at times, but I think sometimes uh, throughout practice, what I've realized and seen is that some of these things are still forgotten, some of these basic principles, and I think there's good business practices in general to remember. So uh, I guess we'll get started. And feel free to interrupt, I like to keep it conversational. I, it'll be much more pleasant than me sitting here and, talking the whole time. So a quick overview of what we plan to cover today. I'll go over a little bit more about my background, uh, why you would want to work with large corporations, and sometimes why not, the risks that come with, with those. Uh, who in here, by the way, has worked with Fortune 500 companies, either coming from or current clients? Okay. Is it from and, and clients, or which from, one? Just okay. from. I've worked with GE and UPS in the past. Okay, great. How about yourself? Both. Mm -hmm. IBM. Okay. Um, Geico, finish line, Okay, great. Um, so some of you guys will be familiar with some of the things I'll share with you. Um, and then how to break in, how to win, and we'll go through some Q&A stuff. And feel free if anybody uh, has, has had some experiences that I don't touch on that you feel are, are very relevant, uh, feel free to chime in. So a little bit of my background, I've been both an entrepreneur and working for, I call myself recovering Fortune 50 sales executive. Uh, been more so on the Fortune 50 side of the house than I have been as an entrepreneur, but I'm actually an entrepreneur today, meaning I've started a, a uh, sales enablement and, um, and coaching, executive coaching business about a year ago. So this is all prior to me starting my, my company now. So just a little glimpse of what I'm doing now as the founder and owner of a company that's called Improved Sales IQ, by the way. And I started this because what I realized is that having worked with small companies, medium, large, uh, a lot of them were seeing the same issues in their, in their sales arena, meaning um, they had a lot of the same issues with either accountability in sales, sales processes, uh, how to really get people um, to, to sell at scale, um, and ultimately, uh, providing hands-on uh, executive level uh, coaching for those who maybe didn't quite have the same resources that uh, I had access to in these big companies. So that's a bit about what I do now and our, our main, uh, so sort of a, a self-promotion here for a second, but our main uh, uh, offering is actually a fractional VP of sales. So we start with um, a part-time approach with a full-time focus on people's goals and their sales um, uh, efforts meaning uh, a lot of what we do is basically come in for a day or two and actually provide that hands-on coaching and support and it can grow with um, that company that we're working with versus having to, a uh, company have to outlay a lot of re precious resources to hire someone full time. So that's usually what I do with, my, with the clients that I have now. All right, so before I throw all these up there, for the folks that, uh, I have worked with these uh, companies in the past or as a current, have current clients. Um, why, why would you consider as a startup or an entrepreneur uh, going after Fortune 500? What are the benefits? Stability and you can scale faster if you actually have a good testimonial from a big company. Sure, what else? The check's not that bad. Sure, <laughs> that's important early on. Anything? Uh, they're a stable person. Okay. All right, so you guys named a lot of those, but instant credibility, lucrative mm -hmm. referrals, they have, do have money in the bank, right? Um, and can help you scale, right, and grow. So a lot of times they'll latch on to first proof of concept and really help you prove it out with um, uh, credible clients. Likewise, I like to cover why not to, because as a, a smaller business or a smaller entity, you have to protect your resources, time, money. Um, so what are some reasons why you wouldn't want to sell these? Companies? Turnover takes a lot of time to What's make that? a decision. They take a lot of time to make a decision. Yeah, they're slow, right? Low margins. Sure. Pain in the neck. Absolutely. Lots of gatekeepers. <laughs> yeah. So just as many reasons probably why not to sell to them. 
<laughs> uh, so if you have the wherewithal, the resources, the time, um, they're great wins. And honestly, you only need one sometimes, right? So great to keep your eyes on the big companies, um, but also realize that all your competition is out there probably looking at the same company. So as soon as you leave uh, out one door, your competitors in the next or uh, well, oftentimes do nothing is the strongest competition for selling to the big companies um, because they're anti-risk, high, re high reward for their uh, proven uh, processes that they have in place. So I'm going to play a quick video. I hope it works before we get into this. So how to break in. From many, one. From many shades of lipstick, one that belongs to her. From a basket of kisses, she picks one. It makes her unique. It colors her kiss. And her kiss, well, it colors her man. Belgian lipstick. Mark your man. I only see one lipstick in your drawing. Women want colors. Lots and lots of colors. Mark your man. It's pretty cute. Well, you like this. Well, maybe we should cut down to five shades or one. I'm not telling you to listen to anyone, but this is a very fresh approach. It's okay, Kelly. I think there's much else to do here, but call it a day. John, well, thank you for your time. Is that all? You're a non-believer. Why should we waste time on Kabuki? I don't know what that means. It means that you've already tried your plan and you're number four. You've enlisted my expertise and you've rejected it to go on the way you've been going. I'm not interested in that. You can understand. I don't think your three months or however many thousands of dollars entitles you to refocus the core of our business. Listen, I'm not here to tell you about Jesus. You already know about Jesus. Either he lives in your heart or he doesn't. Every woman wants choices. But in the end, none wants to be one of a hundred in a box. She's unique. She makes the choices, and she's chosen him. She wants to tell the world he's mine. He belongs to me, not you. She marks her man with her lips. He is her possession. You've given every girl that wears your lipstick the gift of total ownership. Somewhat entertaining, but I think it was all too uh, real when I first saw that <laughs> and uh, described most of my meetings, I think, either selling into Fortune 500 or sometimes being on the other side of the table and uh, turning away a lot of people with fresh ideas. So um, I like to think now it's more more open-minded approach, um, but a lot of these companies still have you know what's tried and true and what's worked and uh, uh, definitely up against the, uh, a huge hurdle going in and trying to talk someone into doing something differently, right? I feel like I can relate most of my experience back to uh, ExxonMobil when I think about those things. Uh, one of the most profitable companies in the world that I had the opportunity to work for, amazing company to work for, but at the same time, uh, I think new ideas came through our doors every day and uh, I don't think very few people got the time of day to, uh, to present those. Um, so anyhow, just kind of entertaining. This is what I was referring to as sort of the elementary part of this. <laughs> um, if you can see that, actually I'll read it to you, so I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the interesting thing I see time and time again, and uh, just because I'm giving a talk today, I kind of, this is not my typical uh, way to approach a, a client or someone that I'm trying to get interested in something, but 7% of the impact that we have on someone is actually the words we say. Whereas 38% is our voice, grammar, confidence, inflection points, uh, a lot of nonverbals. And then 55% is the way we dress, act, walk through the door, and the handshake that so it's kind of interesting, a good reminder, I think, for most of us, um, especially those in sales like myself, I like to talk. And uh, these are all things that the customers kind of made up their decision uh, a lot of times in the first five minutes of meeting you. 
So how to prepare for that first meeting. Um, if you're lucky enough to get a meeting uh, with one of these big clients, you probably have to buy every minute of, of your time in that meeting. So if you're guaranteed 30 minutes or an hour, uh, you probably only got five <laughs> to, uh, to buy the next five and the next 10 after that. So what's the best way of going about doing this? So I'll put a few things up here. I think the most important one is establish your objective before, before the meeting. They understand fully what you're after and that way you can get kind of that almost early commitment from them before you even approach this. And I'm assuming if they're interested in entertaining a meeting with you, they've already gained some kind of level of interest. So at this point, you're talking meetings. Uh, I think the convincing for a moment is on hold and now it's about trying to understand what you're going to accomplish during this short period of time. So along with that, of course, you have an agenda, ask who else will be in the meeting and their roles. And I think these, these slides will be uh, given to you afterwards, so um, you guys can uh, relax <laughs> if you're used to taking notes, but welcome to either way. Um, and, and I guess the importance, the nuances here, I, I'd like to point those out, I guess, because those aren't the, the, the as elementary piece of this. Um, but what happens if someone superior is in the room with them at this meeting? What, how does that impact the conversation you're going to have with the person you're contact that you set up the meeting with if their superior is in the room with them, their boss? It's an unknown. Because you don't know what preparation that person has or hasn't <clears> had <throat> before coming in a meeting. And you may, I mean, that, that's a big iceberg in the room, basically. Yeah. A lot of times you won't really get to the true reasons, the true problems, the true weaknesses, um, and they're afraid to talk out of turn, right? So. Just be aware of that, right? Uh, it's probably best you, you ask those tougher questions one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes the company is more open, but I tend to find more times than not, the bigger the company, the Fortune 500s, they're a little more conservative in, uh, when they greet uh, people from the outside and let them into their world. Um, very sensitive to competition and intellectual property and so forth. I find it helpful like, if you like, use LinkedIn or to find out who you know that works for that company, and then you can actually get some of their internal problems. Use that to your how are you using it? You think that it's kind of a unique way that, other than of course you know finding the biography of someone. Yeah. Well, how are you using it? Anything, anything that's been breakthrough for you? Because uh, I work with um, schools, so if I find out like from someone like an internal teacher, like data that the schools are sharing, I'm able to get their um, problem points right away and cross it over to our solutions. Yeah. And the great thing about these public companies too is there's usually an investor presentation for the latest quarter and honestly they'll give away the strategy sometimes in there uh, and some of the talking points. Um, so good, good things to know and, and of course their LinkedIn is, is usually very helpful. It's probably a good idea to, break, to send a high level overview um, to try to compete for meeting times. You're competing among a lot of priorities here and um, usually testimonials work best I found. But it helps people get kind of a common ground of where you're coming from, what you're going to discuss. They can kind of come more prepared. And likelihood is that uh, if you've identified a pain point, so have they. But surprisingly, sometimes not. Either way, I think it gives people a better basis for coming in prepared to have an intellectual discussion with you. And then develop a meeting plan. And I think this is probably one of the most critical pieces um, that I've found to be most to help me be most successful. And uh, what do I mean by a meeting plan? At a very minimum, you should have an expectation of what you're going to achieve coming out of it. And I, I kind of phrase this as a, a low, mid, and high goal. Like, what is the least likelihood of, or the least successful thing I can gain out of this? And what is the most, you know, the idea of being most successful coming out of this meeting? Sometimes it's just getting to that next meeting, discovering who the other stakeholders are, um, validating an insight that you come into it with. From your research, you've developed certain hypotheses, and you need to prove those out during that meeting sometimes. And so that's, that's really, really valuable in and of itself, is testing those insights. And I think the, having gone through all the different, I'm sure some people in the room have too, but going through all the different trainings out there, um, one of the overwhelming uh, proven techniques out there is starting with a hypothesis or an insight about their business and testing it out. So you come in as a, more of a, Someone that knows their business, uh, knows how they operate, and can understand their pain points versus an outsider coming in and trying to pitch a, a product or service. Hopefully that leads to your solution, of course, but that's the idea.
So we're playing a quick, uh, a quick game here. <laughs> um, so I'll go through these, and I'm just putting up. You, you basically have to uh, raise your hand. I guess is the best way to do this one. Or more volunteers. I'll take a volunteer if you want to answer it. Um, no pressure either way. Is we'll read the comments, and then you just let me know if that's a professional or rookie move in, in a first meeting environment. So keep in mind it's first meeting. All right, so the first one, start with some warmer, possible relevant story or current event. What do you think that one is? Professional. Everybody agree? Mm. Yeah, these are somewhat TJ biased, so keep that in mind too. I'm sure we can debate it later over drinks. <laughs> start off with you and your company. Nope. Oh, rookie. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are right for us. Try to confirm, validate, expand your hypothesis theory. I think I was trying to give this away earlier, but how big of a problem is this? And usually if you can equate it to increased revenue, cost savings, uh, and or time, um, who does this affect? Know the key performance indicators, and then what are the implications of them not taking action urgency? Obviously, which one do you think this one is? <laughs> a little more detail there. What about the next one on the top right? Share relevant insight about their business and seek clarification. Use data if you, data if you have it. Professional. Discuss your product solutions without first understanding the problem and the value you're solving it. Rookie. Yeah. Get incremental commitments early and often. Professional. Professional. Okay. So. Sort of giveaways, but I think a lot of times we forget these things. Um, I've seen, gosh, I don't know, nine times out of ten, I've, I'm guilty of it too, is uh, we get excited and get in there. And they ask us, okay, what is it you have to show me? First of all, I think if you're invited in for, hey, can you come give me a presentation or a lunch and learn or something of that nature, you're kind of already at a disadvantage. If that's the first conversation you're having with someone, right? Say so you sent them an email, they got a brochure they downloaded from your website, Whatever, how they ever they came across you, but the first interaction with someone is, hey, can you come in here and show us your product and your solution? Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily pass up on that opportunity, but I would, I would try to have a little deeper understanding and conversation because we'll get to some points in a minute here why I can explain why that's uh, almost a disadvantage. Um, but at that point, I think they've kind of already decided in their minds like, what their, their expectation is, and especially a Fortune 500 company, um, they may already have a partner in mind and they're looking for, for weaknesses or holes in that one, so they might use, it, use you to their, their advantage in negotiations as well, and also just to get a quote. So. Um, and that kind of follows being uh, the RFQ process, request for quotation. I mean, it's, it's when, by the time you've already gotten to that point, it's, you know, if you already haven't had those higher level discussions, assuming you also have something unique about your product or some intellectual property they may not be aware of that would be a unique competitive advantage for them, um, they already commoditized you. So, um, while it's helpful to gain the buy-in of other stakeholders, especially I find this in engineering communities, um, is that yes, you will get to a point where you will need to do this for the engineers to get their buy-in and they'll want to know every ins and outs of your service or product or offering solution, right? Um, but until you are brought in by someone with enough leverage that says now, okay, TJ, I'm on board, or whoever, you know, I'm on board with what you're telling me here, and I understand the value to my company, but I'm going to need you know the engineers to give their their nod of approval on this. So there comes a time and a place where I think that's important, but I think starting off that way, not having that in-depth discussion about value that you can add, um, it can put you at a disadvantage. And then of course the biggest competitive threat is is do nothing. That's usually what you're up against with these big companies. All right. So how do you how do you win? How do you come across as a uh, <laughs> you survive the battle, <laughs> come out a little bit worn down probably, and you know beat up? But uh, let's look at what the drivers are for these decisions. And when I first saw this, the most surprising thing to me was that value to price ratio being only nine percent. It's incredibly important. Don't get me wrong. You still have to be within the realm of reality, right? They have certain ROI thresholds they have to meet. Um, so you have to be within that range. I feel like you probably wouldn't have gotten that, you know, very far otherwise uh, if they hadn't started to determine whether you were roughly in, in the fit of their budget, right? Uh, but more importantly, above company and brand impact, the product, the service, 
And I find this more often with entrepreneurs, um, get really product focused, really committed to the brand, what it means, um, all great things, but oftentimes, and this is, and I apologize not putting my resources up here, but um, this has come from quite a bit of research uh, in the field. Uh, I can share this with you when I share my, my PowerPoint later. But overwhelmingly, it was the sales experience that set them apart uh, from their competition. And the reason being is it was the people that came in and helped them navigate the landmines, uh, show, some, show them the unique values, um, basically show them how to sell, show them how to sell it to the rest of the organization. organization. And so this goes back to my earlier point. So you want to lead them to your solutions, not with your solutions. So avoiding the come in and tell me what, you, what it is that you do versus, well, let me first make sure I have a good understanding of your business. Um, here's what I understand so far is true. Um, maybe here's a data point or there's a data point on a trend or a challenge or a struggle that you've seen or read or heard and you're validating it, right? Is this true? How big of a problem is it for you? How much is it costing you? What would it mean if I could solve that, right? In terms of usually revenue or cost reduction. Um, and then yes, essentially, you're hopefully leading them down a road or else you're having a, <laughs> a conversation where you're opening up for a competitor otherwise. But you're leading them down a road that uh, leads to your solution. And you're usually talking about a conversation about business outcomes and risk management during that conversation. Less about features and functions. So again, what are some checks on if you know you're talking to the right person, having the right conversation? You can challenge them, they can challenge you. Right? They're open to learning from you. They understand that you're a credible resource of knowledge. As well as, they're also just not going to take what you're giving them as, oh, okay, this is great, thanks for you know, sharing this all with me. They're probably going to have some thoughts of their own on how, this, how they get this done, right? This, this problem solved. And so you're usually talking strategy, key performance, indica key performance indicators over features and benefits. If you start talking to someone and they're asking you about the features and benefits of your product, that's great. Yeah. Good, for, good for you, good for them, but uh, likely it is they're probably not talking to the, the right person at the right level. And then this person could also grant you sponsorship or access to others. And so it's important to realize that while we want to get that meeting with the CEO, VP, director, highest level we can, um, by all means, get that introduction, but it's probably wise to at least go in and understand who his or her stakeholders are in the process and who he or she has hired and paid the, you know, the big bucks to, to to help make those decisions. Because odds are if they're a successful CEO, they're not making those kind of decisions on their own. And generally in a big company environment, there's no single stake, there's no single decision maker. And then of course make it seem like their idea when you do come to this conclusion on, hey, this is a big problem, this is what it's worth if someone could solve it, right? Uh, and then play off of the feedback they're giving you and um, help them build support in their organization by, by really championing, championing, championing them throughout the organization around this idea. So I'll pause there for any questions, I guess, since I've been doing a lot of talking so far. Any questions, comments? Yeah, I was kind of curious, so uh, a couple of slides back, I've fallen into the, the uh, situation that you described where I wanted to go in and have a conversation, but they, the customer or the people were expecting like a show. What do you, what do you, do you have any ideas what we do beforehand to mitigate that, or even if, I, if you're in the situation, how do you sure. yeah. flip it? I think once you've gotten to that meeting and that's their expectations, it's, you kind of, have to go along with it to some degree, show, yeah. um, but I think there's ways that you can mitigate that or prevent that from happening to begin with. I think with all about what I went back to earlier with the objective and getting clear. So what I like to do, sorry, I'm going back a little bit here. So with this objective for the meeting, a lot of times I'll ask, well, of course, if I take a step back from that, right? So you sent an email, had a phone call, whatever it was, mm -hmm. you guys connected, right? Mutual friend, whatever. Um, sounded interesting. Okay, we're on the phone now. Or email dialogue. Uh, so great. Hey, what time can we meet? You know, you know, next week. Okay, awesome. 
get your time locked down, and during that process, you're like, all right, well, here's the re you know reason for my meeting. Hopefully, before that, um, with the agenda items, I like to get them to propose some agenda items as well as myself, kind of come together on that, and then also kind of it's almost like a pre-meeting going on. We're actually starting to like say, I think the best use of our time would be spent here, here. What do you think? And then they put in a couple things, and it'll it'll be. A, It'll make them come to the table with the expectation you're going to have a conversation versus just you presenting, hey, here's my solution or product, and take, take, take from me while I get nothing in return, right? Um, and maybe there's that 1% chance that some of those things end up in, oh, this is so impressive, never seen anything like it, um, we want to buy, you know, next week. But well, I think more oftentimes is the, hey, thanks for coming, you know. <laughs> right. We, re we really liked it. It was really neat, interesting, right? Um, we, you know, we'll talk about it and get back to you. And maybe some of the small talk things that you listed as the, the pro uh, moves might help a little bit too. If, if it strikes a chord and a conversation ignites before we jump into the slide deck. Sure. And it's, you know, hey, I'd love to come in and show you all about what my company does and, you know, products, services, et cetera. But just to make sure I understand what we're after here, you know, can I, you mind if we have a quick dialogue, hop on the phone for 30 minutes just to make sure everybody's time is used best in this meeting? Because I know. It, you know, you guys are obviously very busy, and 30 minutes or even an hour of your time is going to cost money. So I just want to make sure that we're setting up uh, a very, very productive meeting for both you and, my, and myself. And so then I hop on the phone for those 30 minutes and say, hey, what do you think about this, that, and you, know, you just kind of plan it out together. Mm -hmm. And I think it has some, they, they buy a stake into to the objective too. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your recommend, recommendations on reaching out to like specific people in the corporation? Because I know a lot of times they don't take the time to respond or even see your email. Uh, and a warm intro would go a long way, but like... The what was that last part about? The last, a warm system. intro. Oh, yeah. So that goes yeah. a long way, but a lot of times developing a network with people in a certain corporation is not easy as well. Like, for example, L'Oreal. You know, they have their products. I want to advertise their products, mm -hmm. whatever. How would I reach out to someone who would set up that meeting that is critical to us presenting the idea to the corporation? Sure. So I guess I go to look at other influencers in their life. Um, <laughs> And it's tough. I mean, this is, this is the, the biggest thing, right? The, the hardest part is actually getting that first meeting. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the, the direct route of just emailing or phone calling someone, they've, mm -hmm. you and a hundred other people have probably tried the same thing that week or day or whatever, right? So they're just screening them or not even looking at them. Uh, but what are, a lot of times you can hop on, and someone said it earlier, the LinkedIn shows their social following, some mm -hmm. meetings they go to, whatever, like the industry events. Um, I start showing up at those things. <laughs> start, uh, you know, start poking around with people that I think are at lower levels but have access to the circle that's maybe too removed from that person. Mm. Uh, and eventually, someone's going to introduce you. But everybody's got their own. I'm sure every, you know, there's others in the room that could provide good advice on this too. But um, certainly LinkedIn, and, and usually you can get. For me, at least, it's been like a, I don't know, it's a fairly high percentage of people that I, that are two or three removed that I can get to connect with me. And then I think that shows that hey, I'm not just some stranger trying to connect with you. So that, that's been helpful. Anybody else have any advice on that question? Because that's a, that's a good one. Oh. I just started showing up at the same events they showed up to them and beeline them the first time. But there's some potential pitfalls. Um, selling to the wrong person or give you upward mobility to the organization. Have that situation happen with a very over that person and be like, how do you, after you've had like face to face time with them, you find the person above them? And, I mean, you can find them on LinkedIn, I get that, but like, how yeah. do you? Well, that's the, the, I think that's one of the intricacies, that's a great question, of Fortune 500 in and of itself is that to your advantage, and it depends on the person, but um, I mean, if you're in the C suite already and <laughs> they've blocked you, it's a, Probably a little different discussion, but let's just assume that it was maybe not a C-suite member or Fortune 500. Uh, who, who, what level was this, by the way, that, that blocked you kind of in a way and said no? Um, you know? Regional director. Okay. Yeah. So usually, to your advantage, the companies are so big, like you can go to the next group over or something. Like, yeah, I mean, odds are they didn't hear about that conversation, right? Start there. <laughs> um, usually, if I get that first meeting, even at a director level, or higher, uh, getting introductions to others as quickly as possible, even if it's just via email or through who else can we invite to this meeting, you know, who else would this benefit hearing what we have to say kind of thing, right? And so you just quickly get that handshake, that business card exchange, 
it almost gives you permission to go over their head later because you've already had an, an interaction. Um, reaching out on, on, on LinkedIn sometimes too. Yeah, so nowadays I think sometimes it's easier to, to excuse yourself from for going over someone in a way, right? Um, than it would be in smaller organizations. Very tough to do, right? Because they probably know about it. You know, you've been you've been, you've been blocked already. So. The person's probably at the next table. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess that's. In a nutshell, I keep going after different different folks. Um, anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Being blocked at a certain level, getting around it. I mean, the only thought I have is, is this? Uh, would you not talk to the regional director? Like, say you got the meeting, would you stall it or delay it until if you felt like she or he was someone that would say no but couldn't? say yes, would you stall and delay that meeting and try to get the higher level or do you take the regional director meeting anyway because that's what you got? Well this happened after the you, meeting, it was already a no. Mm -hmm. but right. it, was a, it was not a strong no, it was pretty much just like, oh well I am trying to get all this other stuff pushed through the door so yeah, this is other, not a priority. Other priority. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so then I, I would take the meeting for sure, especially director level of a Fortune 500 that's a pretty senior level usually, uh, someone that's been in the company for a while. Uh, or many, many years of experience. So, uh, but when securing it, I think <clears throat> proactively you can certainly say a um, couple things that, I, that have helped me personally have been, you know, who else other than yourself, of course, is involved in a decision like this? Who else has been impacted by, you know, this area, this issue that my company is addressing? Um, you know, if we were to have a meeting on, on on your company location, you know, who's available that day that can help sit in and provide another perspective on this. Uh, obviously, it's a very, very big challenge a lot of others in the industry have been trying to solve, and so I just, you know, I think for sharing, you know, lessons learned or whatever, we could probably benefit from having a few more people in the room. So in that, in that case, that's where it's beneficial to have all those people, but then my earlier comment was sometimes in a big group setting like that, you know, I've, and oftentimes my meetings ended up with 10 people around a table and just me. <laughs> uh, a lot of times I'll try to bring someone from my company too in that case, but um, you can't open up as many of the Pandora's box items as you wish you could, you know, if they were one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? So there's just certain aspects of each one that you have to take, a, take advantage of. Does, does that help at all? Or? And then of course, if you do get into a conversation where they're talking about the features and functions of your um, product or solution or service, uh, odds are uh, these are not always true, there's always the exceptions, but these are usually lower level folks. Um, I always try to think of the exception being a lot of times the engineer or technical person. <laughs> they, they'll still want to poke at it and then try to you know, break it open, look inside, all those things, right? But they're focusing on the wrong thing and they probably haven't understood what you're really out there solving quite yet. Um, that's surface level stuff, I think, that people can get from a brochure, or website, a video, something like that. Whereas the more important information comes from um, other conversations. And what this does too is it a lot of times reveals a weakness in your solution. So they may be comparing you to other types of solutions and by you coming in and just showing all the features of your product and this or that, they probably saw something somewhere else and they're like, well, what about this? And all of a sudden you don't have that, right? <laughs> or the, the, the flip side is all these features and functions, well, they don't see the value in all of them, so they think it's over-engineered and now it costs too much. And it's hard to implement, right? Uh, they can't really see past some of these things. Um, it is, it's distracting, I think, a lot of times. That's fine if you end, end up eventually getting to that point, right? They're describing your product or service in that level of detail, but only after I think you've had the more important conversations, which are around the revenue, ROI, like the actual impact, business outcomes. I think we already covered this one, but <laughs> going, avoiding going over some set. Get those early introductions. Even in the hallways to and from those meetings, right? There's a, usually big companies, Fortune 500 have big offices. Going down halls with all kinds of doors, and maybe these open office environments. Um, you're poking, like, hey, who sits there? And, you know, hey, can I meet? <laughs> be, be annoying if you have to be, right? Like At that, at that early, early phase, right? Uh, stop in the hallway at the coffee station, somebody else is probably there, you're like, oh, I'm so-and-so, blah, 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 who are you? <laughs> so they might eventually drag you and say, come with me. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's, it's worthwhile.
And then the other potential landmines, not understanding their internal process. So what do I mean by this? What's your buying cycle? Are you on a fiscal year calendar that matches, you know, does your fiscal year match your calendar year? You should know that before you go in. And when are you budgeting and actually buying? Yeah, that's important to understand. Where are they getting approval for these? A lot of times, it's different for each company, but a lot of times they can get additional approval for the quarter kind of thing if, if they're on a um, fiscal calendar year budget. Um, but more importantly, we'll get to some stuff in a minute, I think that'll reveal what I'm trying to get at here. Um, it has to do with sales cycle versus buying process. But before we get there, some of the top concerns of Fortune 500 decision makers. And I say makers, and I have just one person represented here, but imagine that as a group of people standing there because I've never found, and at least in my uh, you know, sales experience, that it's one person, not in these big companies. So is it worth the risk? Is this a turnkey solution? So that when I say is it, worth, is it worth the risk, is it worth the risk of me putting my job on the line? That's really the question they're probably asking themselves, especially at that level having a strategic type of conversation and asking them to do something new, cutting edge, breakthrough, you name it, right? Try something different. Um, and that's why I think a lot of times they go to they defer back to this group setting and you have to get these other stakeholders involved. Is this a turnkey solution? The last thing they want to go do is figure out, okay, you have this one piece of the puzzle, then I have to go find this other piece. Uh, they really just want something, even if they go pay extra. Uh, they just understand what it's going to take to implement it and make sure it's as turnkey as possible. How am I going to sell this internally? Is there a budget? I think that was pretty obvious. Uh, how will this provide a competitive advantage? Um, so oftentimes, I think it was in that kind of that video I showed earlier from Admin, but uh, you're, I think you said you're currently number four or something like that, and you keep think, trying the same things, right? <laughs> so they're always looking at who's just right above them, who are their peers, what are they doing? Um, so really talking to that. And then which of the my goals will this help me meet? This goes in back to that investor presentation I was talking about. You can find on the website usually. Um, and it has to be relevant to their role too, because it could be a strategic imperative for the company, right? Some social impact imperative, or environmental, or what have you. But unless it's direct impact on that role, <coughs> it's going to be a tough one. And then do you have proof of concept? Um, while I have landed proof of concept with a really big company before, uh, it was incredibly hard. Uh, they don't want to be the ones that ultimately what comes down to in that conversation was do you have the liquidity <laughs> to cover to cover my ass quite frankly right like if this goes wrong and, you know but usually they'll spread out that you know um, and don't have that kind of impact if something does go wrong but usually want to see the proof of concept so what if, I think a question that was asked of me coming in because a lot of the companies I see teach sales cycle, sales process, isn't aligned with buyer's process and buying cycle. What do I mean by that? Well, it's really the buyer's journey. What steps do they take to get to your solution? And so if you think about it this way, naturally your sales will align with what their needs are versus forcing a sales process on something. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this before. This isn't, you know, any, any marketing people in the room or, okay. But awareness, consideration, decision. How do you go about that phase? It shows that 72% of people will go to Google uh, to do their research ahead of time. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, a customer is already familiar with you know, what you're doing, the options they have available to them. Uh, they're less wanting to be sold and more wanting to be educated on incremental value and unique differentiators of your, of your offering. So this is a great time to have that marketing campaign set up where they download the brochure from your website, right? Um, share a customer testimonial. Wait to bring in a salesperson almost. It's like kind of, you, you nurture it a little bit here. Uh, not a hard sell at all, just sort of, you, know, you set them up on a, a drip, nurture campaign, if you will, uh, where they interact with uh, different materials that you have available. And then step two is where they're starting to do the they're researching a lot heavier. They're trying to find the criteria, justification, eliminating options. And this is probably a good point to bring in, have a sales meeting or a sales representative, uh, whether it's yourself or if, you have, if you're a slightly more mature company, a sales representative. But, um, and this is where you really want to focus on less about features, functions, all those things they could have learned already from your other materials, website and stuff, 
and more about the actual impact on the bottom line with revenue and ROI. And then lastly, it's the decision phase. And this is really, I think, most important where you talk about implementation, the startup costs, what support you can provide. I almost assume you have the sale at this point. Uh, I start talking about how you're going to implement it. And then this is a good time also to share case studies with others that are similar size, types, customers, etc. Any questions here? You guys all seen this before? What's a good way to have like product reviews about putting it on your website? <clears throat> I'm sorry, repeat that. Oh, what's a great way to present like product reviews without having it all on your website? Without having it on your website? Yeah. Uh, in a confidential way because you don't want your competitors to just say it. You do that. You can do that. Um, you know, um, white paper okay. that people can download to get their sure. email address. As for the lead form, yeah, yeah. you can do that. That's a good point. If you don't have any uh, sales or customers yet, how? Uh, what are some examples of some ways you can uh, accomplish step one? Gotcha. Step one being awareness. Um, no sales, no customers. Uh, I think you could still have educational material of what you're trying to solve, the solution, the potential impact, while having the full solution. Um, so you're really looking for more proof of concept, tech customer, right? Um, yeah, I think you can still use a lot of the same things, um, and, and just people understanding that you're a startup and that. But yeah, it'll be a different different audience, right? It wouldn't be mass marketed to every tar every tar every potential prospect in in your target market. Right. It'd be more of a, you know, collect an email, share it one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, right? Um, any other thoughts there from people with early stage proof of concept stuff still? I think it's probably most of us in the room, right? And it won't take long, too, to build that trust and credibility. I think even once you get a, a few stakeholders in it, Consortium, if you will, a group that comes comes together and helps support your idea and goal because they have a similar goal or outcome, and then you can start to leverage that that network to help say you're an early, um, you know, investor, lack of better words, but early stakeholder, and uh, you'll get special access granted um, when it first release, some kind of early privilege, right, return, and so they can help you build it. You know, don't feel like you're on your own to build these kind of uh, things. They can help build them for you. So other considerations, and we're getting towards the end of this here, so thanks for staying with me. Um, get on the approved vendor list. That happened to me one time where I was selling to a big oil company, um, and I got to the end, and they weren't ready to buy, and uh, I thought I'd already checked the box, because this was kind of a new technology. There really weren't specifications out there for it, necessarily. And so I'm like, all right, it's unique. Engineers have signed off on it. Nope, still the materials I was using and some of the processes along the way. Uh, get on this list, the quality management aspect of things. Um, sometimes you can public, you can find these on public domains, public sites. Um, you can just ask as well, you know, straight out, straight out. Say what are what are what's your management quality management process? What's the vendor approval process like? Get those questions out of the way early, right? So when it does come to a buying decision, that's not holding you up. Um, and the obvious route is often the one that your competitor took. So sometimes I look for adjacent value, incremental value at different places. One example, a story. I was selling a clean tech product. Uh, I was working for a very it's a micro cap company really. It was a really, really small company, 100 employees, just breaking into this new market. Um, their background was in conserving energy, preserving energy in uh, water desalination. And they were trying to bring this new technology that helped reduce the energy in this process of making essentially bottled water um, by 98%. That's, that's the solution did it. Reduce the amount of energy consumed in producing bottled water by 98%. And so they found a way to introduce this to oil and gas clients, but never proven it before. It worked in water, could it work in oil, that kind of thing, right? Um, well, what ended up happening here, instead of just going straight after the energy conserving route, it turns out that in one of the countries I was trying to sell into, as was Canada, um, their environmental policies were, were fairly strict and they had a lot of um, high goals around envi environmental impact for a lot of their processing facilities, gas processing. Long story short, um, the adjacent value, the value that really got me in into their um, top 10 priorities list, if you will, was the environmental impact my product would have, the redu reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere, not necessarily the energy they consumed. And usually you think oil and gas go straight for the bottom line, <laughs> you know, profit, right? Um, but for them, it was re if they were capped at production based off CO2 uh, emissions, 
and I was able to actually take those CO2 emissions just below a threshold that allowed them to actually produce a lot more. So that incremental revenue from production way, way uh, oh, overdid any kind of uh, cost savings from uh, electricity or energy consumption. So that's what I mean by indirect, indirect or additional value. Um, so it's not always the obvious thing that your product does. You might find a new, a new solution or a new benefit that your, your product provides that you didn't know existed uh, throughout this process. Uh, sometimes it's manufacturability, streamlining, uh, ease of implementation, startup costs, a lot of things, right? Um, and then construct, construction, constructive tension is good, meaning that uh, you don't want to go in and pick a fight with anybody, but I think you certainly want to challenge people's ideas, status quo, how they've done things, uh, as long as you can kind of back it up with, that's not how I'm seeing it, here's the data, right? Versus just a philosophical debate. <laughs> So what are the next steps? All right, so hopefully we've gotten a little bit out of this. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, I think we'll share this presentation through the Mass Challenge Network, but you can certainly email me too. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a startup in myself, so I don't have a ton of content on my website yet, but I'm developing more and more. Um, and it's really just trying to pick all these things out of my brain that <laughs> collected over the years, as well as what's working with customers and what's not. So I'll try to update things there. So anyhow, I guess by, by saying that, it's like an adjective to the, um, the newsletter list. And then uh, schedule office hours with me. Uh, I'll try to get in here, let's say once a, once a week uh, is my high goal. <laughs> Minimum once every other week. Um, but I'll, as soon as you see that. How do you guys see that up here, by the way? Does, it, does an email go out when someone like myself posts uh, office hours? Or yes, they get, I think so. Or do you have to log into something? Um, you actually have to log into our platform, and it will show up. That you're personal. So, how often are you guys logging into the Mass Challenge platform to see these kind of updates? Three days. Yeah. Every three days. Every three days? Okay. That's good for me to know. I'm just trying to think because sometimes I might have an opening, really short notice kind of thing, and I, I didn't know if it's worth it for, you know, to post something the day before, right? Um, so I don't know if that's beneficial or if it has to be like you guys need to see a week out, right? So that sounds like more of the latter. Is that true? They just post any time. Yeah. Well, and I can also put in the Facebook group, like, he's hosting office hours from this time and this time today. Yeah, a lot of times it might just be, hey, I've got an hour or two, you know, mm -hmm. a day or two from now. Uh, I'm going to make sure that works. Um, either, have you, either of you, or anybody in the room heard of either of these two, two books? No? All right. So some of the things that I pulled from our end of my presentation were, from these, I think early technology, kind of early adopter stuff, uh, startups crossing the chasm is great read, and then the challenger sale. While a lot of people will debate, um, you know, what the what the leading uh, um, principles are out there, I think this one ties it all together pretty well uh, in terms of how to get people talking about uh, insights, true problems, and how to solve those versus features and functions. I think we're at our time limit too, so I appreciate uh, everyone's time today. I had a little Jeopardy game to play, but I think we already took all the time up, so <laughs> I'll save you guys until but next time. Any questions, I guess, from the last few minutes? Uh, any sense like to be more attractive for RFPs? Yes. <laughs> our, our, our re request for proposals, right? Yeah, or quote, yeah, right, Q's and P's. Um, I think by the time I've usually received them, and I'm just speaking from my personal experience, it's too late. Like if I'm trying to provide, I'd almost prefer to decline them sometimes because usually you've been commoditized at that point, meaning they don't think that as much to differentiate you other than your price. So, in order to avoid getting RFQ to RFP, if you will, and then taking up all your time replying to these. They're good lessons learned if you can get them in and you can get them to agree to share the results with you. But if they're not willing to share the results of the RFP or, or RFQ rather, in that case, request for quote, meaning that they won't share with you the outcome, that they picked this company and didn't pick you, and here was why to some degree, okay. but then I would almost refuse because what I guess my question would be to you would be what would you get out of it? Um, usually to avoid that early on is to get those meetings we were talking about earlier, have those conversations around value and unique differentiators to the point where you're actually writing up the proposal process because by the time it's gone to procurement, which is where you can get the RFP from, RFQ, then it's obviously looking for certain criteria, but 
Um, and I don't know, anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah. yeah. And I think anybody else have any? If I applied for it, they helped me out, but I wouldn't like to do that. They'll yeah. work for you. I mean, there's no harm in if it's a learning and you're just starting to do them, then it's not, I would continue doing them. It's going to find, it's going to hone in your approach and how you talk about